Welcome to Texas History's Week 3 and 4 Lecture Series on Mexican Independence. This slide is just a review of the last class period, especially on Spanish Texas. Again, this is just some of the things I'm looking at for possible test questions. This slide right here is, is just for your general knowledge, and you won't see this on a test. What this basically is about is back in 1716, some guys wanted to impress uh, the, the monarchy of Spain, uh, King Philip II, King Philip V. What they wanted to do was uh, name some new territory after them, like they did with the Philippine Islands and the Pacific Ocean. It never really caught on, even when, it, when they first did it, and it definitely didn't catch on in the 1800s. The reason why I'm I'm including this slide in this lecture is if you decide to study Texas history later on, you might see this. And so I just wanted to explain why why it's a part of Texas history. But again, this won't be on any test you have. I just wanted you to have it for your general information. I wanted you to give you a quick backstory on a Louisiana because it's going to have an effect on Texas in the 1800s. So going back to the French and Indian War, which was also called the Seven Years' War in Europe, there was a reshuffling of land ownership by the European powers in North America. France knew they were losing, and they want they want Britain to get all the the land in North America. So they went to their current friends, the Spanish, uh, a year before the war ended, and they secretly signed a treaty, handing over the Louisiana territory to them. The the funny thing about the the French and the and the Spanish is they have a love-hate relationship going on. Sometimes they'll be at war with each other, and sometimes they'll be friends, and they're handing large tracts of land to each other. So it depends on what time, time uh, in history you're talking about, whether they're friends or enemies. Anyways, uh, France, Spanish, uh, excuse me, they colonize it, try to work it, but they, they don't have enough people to really uh, make anything happen. Uh, so in 1800, Spain gives it back to Napoleon and the French. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he comes into power in the early 1800s of France, and he's on a conquest to, to gather land. I don't think Spain really had a, a, a choice in the matter to give the land back. But anyways, they did. So Napoleon had big plans for this land. He wanted to colonize it, put a lot of forts, get some settlements going, and, and make a large presence in, uh, in North America for France. The problem was, was at this time, uh, France's colonies in the Caribbean were under turmoil. The the slaves that were there, especially in, in Haiti, which, it, which at the time was called Santo Domingo, they were in rebellion and they were winning. And so France uh, had needed to send an army, about 20,000 forces there, to try to put the rebellion down, which they failed to do. Anyways, what this did to the Louisiana territory was it put everything on hold and pretty much uh bonaparte uh napoleon couldn't really uh fulfill the dreams that he had for the territory while he was while this was all going on he was also trying to con uh, conquer europe and so he had a lot of debts that were mounting up so what he figured was he was going to lose the louisiana territory anyways to the expanding united states so in 1803 he decided to to t cut his losses and make some money from it, $15 million, and sold it to the United States in 1803. So now focusing on Texas, the Louisiana Purchase creates a, a, a new struggle for Spain now between the United States and, and Spanish authorities in Texas. And so, again, just like the French, the United States is claiming that the Sabine River is a western boundary of the Louisiana Territory. And Spain, again, is saying no. It's 50 miles to the east at a place called Arroyo Hondo. And so there's there's two aren't there. The Spanish forces in Texas and the, the U.S. forces in Louisiana, a couple patrols shoot each other. There's some minor skirmishes, but there's no, like, amassing in the armies or anything to, to move on each other. The the forces there, the U.S. forces and the Spanish forces in the area, decide that to quit the skirmishing. And in 1806, they come to an agreement. It's kind of a, a like a demilitarized zone. 
and it was called the neutral zone. And so what they did was the 50 miles was in dispute between the Sabine River and the Arroyo Hondo. They decided to make it a, a no man's land for, for uh, the U.S. And, and Spanish forces. People could go in there and do their business, but they didn't want the militaries in there. And in 1819, it would become the boundaries would become official with Secretary of State John Quincy Adams meeting with the uh, Spanish diplomat Luis de Onis, where they would focus up, uh, where they were come to an agreement with the uh, Adams Onis Treaty. And what that did was it established the Sabine River as the western portion of the Louisiana Purchase. And then what they did also, besides just defining what between the uh, between Louisiana and Texas, they went ahead up along the Red River, the Panhandle, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And, and they defined what the boundary was between newly acquired U.S. land and existing Spanish land. You remember at this time in 1819, Spain is also uh, in a decades-long struggle for independence from its, its uh, former colonies. So they really don't have much choice in the matter to settle with, with the powerful United States. So this was a, a this was a good way for them to to cede the boundary to the United States and save some face for them. Next, I want to talk about Mexico's fight for independence since it will have an impact on the area that we know as Texas. So, as I mentioned before, Spain and France had a love-hate relationship going on, and this was very evident in the uh, 1790s and early 1800s. Even before Napoleon came into power in France, Spain started to see some uh, some displeasure in their uh, New Spain territories, especially Mexico. So the thing was, was people were tired of living under an oppressive caste system. They were tired of a, a king 3,000 miles away making laws that had no uh, bearing on them. And then they were tired of the Spanish authorities and Spanish army in New Spain keeping them oppressed. And so the people started grumbling and started talking about fighting for independence from Spain. And they may have been encouraged by the American and French revolutions that happened in the 1770s to the 1790s. Well, the thing that, that kind of got the thing, got the idea for independence going was Napoleon decided to invade Spain in 1807. He conquered Spain and he put uh, his brother Joseph on the Spanish throne. So Spain, the nation of Spain was occupied by, by this uh, invasion of Napoleon. This gave the new Spain territories, especially Mexico, the excuse they needed to, uh, to get going on independence. Spain did try, even though they were occupied by the France, by the French and, and Joseph, they still tried to hold on to their territories. The problem was with, with the independence movement in the New Spain territories was this, it, they were done locally. They, it wasn't done in a concerted effort. Like you remember in, in the American Revolution, there were 13 separate colonies, but when it came time to fight against Britain, they all got together, formed a Continental Congress, and they acted as in, in one unison. This wasn't the case with the the fight for independence from Spain. Each region was acting on its own, had its own leaders, and there wasn't any kind of coordination going on between all the uh, fights for independence against Spain. Some of this displeasure that we talked about was seen in areas like Querétaro. There was a number of disgruntled Criollos, Mestizos, and Indians that were upset with the rule of the peninsulars there. But everybody was, was unhappy, but no one was willing to step forward and get the, the ball rolling on independence until a Criollo priest named Father Miguel Hidalgo e Castilla, which he's actually known as, as Father Hidalgo, stepped up and he... he basically got the ball rolling on Mexico's independence. On September 16, 1810, Father Hidalgo declared independence with an historic proclamation urging his fellow Mexicans to take up arms against Spanish government. This proclamation was called the Grito de Dolores. 
it, its impact was about the same as the Declaration of, of Independence had on on the 13 colonies deciding to, to declare independence from Great Britain. The Grito de Dolores was was Mexico's call for independence against Spain. So it 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 was a spark. It was finally someone declared we need independence from Spain. That guy was Father Hidalgo, and so the the fight is on for Mexican independence. This slide is is just and to give you an idea of where all the states in Mexico are located. Real fast, I wanted to point out that after Mexico gains its independence, Texas and Coahuila are made into one state. And so we'll study that later on in the future slides. The initial phase of Father Hidalgo's fight for Mexican independence saw great success as 50 to 80,000 people would join him in this fight. In the state of Guanajuato, there was a large number of peninsulars and loyal Coyoyos killed. It really caught Spain off guard. It wasn't until a new viceroy was was installed in Mexico City, General Felix Maria Callejas, that the rebel army's success was able to be halted. In January 1811, Callejas defeated Hidalgo outside Guadalajara, which is down in, in south central Mexico, and it forced it forced Father Hidalgo and the other rebel leadership to flee northward up towards Texas. They were hoping. Texas was was uh, a stronghold for rebels. There was a lot of, of, of rebel forces up there called they were called the Republicans. And so there was a lot of them up there. And so Father Hidalgo and his leadership hoped to find some refuge up there. After a few months of being in Texas, Father Hidalgo and his and his leadership team decided to go back to Mexico and try to resume the rebel armies drive for success. On March 21st, 1811, a loyalist officer ambushed the insurgent leadership near Maclava, which uh, Maclava, Maclava, excuse me, is located in the northern portion of uh, Mexico, right below the Rio Grande. With this action, the northern provinces returned to royalist control, but didn't stop the revolution. And so what happens is instead of having this large army the re that the rebels had early on in the early phases of the Mexican independence, the 50 to 80,000 numbers uh, that it enjoyed, it's now become just a series of little guerrilla actions, small, small unit actions that fight against the Spanish authority. They kind of lose their momentum, but they don't lose the desire for independence. Anyways, with, with Father Hidalgo, and his leadership, the, they're sent to Chihuahua for, to stand trial. They're found guilty and sentenced to death. Father Hidalgo, being a, a Catholic priest, had to go through a, a separate trial under the Roman Catholic Church to have his uh, fatherhood stripped and then also found guilty as well from, from the, the church. On July 30th, him and one of his lieutenants are, are executed. The Spanish... Uh, go to the corpse, they decapitate the head, and they hang up the heads in, in the, the uh, state of Guanajuato, where they had earlier initial success as a warning to others of what will happen to them. So for seven or eight years, Mexico's fight for independence uh, stagnated, which, as we said earlier, kind of went to just small unit tactics, fighting here and there, not really winning any major ground. That would all change though, and and the Mexican fight for independence would get a, a, a secondary push, but it wouldn't happen from within Mexico. It would it happen in Spain. In January 1820, there was an army being built up in Spain to, to sell to Argentina to put the rebellion down there. Well, that army mutinied, and it sparked a rebellion among other army units throughout Spain. The, the rebelling army was joined by other dissatisfied Spaniards with the absolute rule of King Ferdinand and his six years that he was on the throne. What they wanted was, was the king to go back to being a constitutional monarch under the constitution of 1812. Well, that this gave Mexico, the, 
the second wind it needed to, to continue its success for Mexican independence. And so a new, uh, a new leader would rise uh, for the Mexican rebels, Augustin de Iturbide. He was, he was uh, a royalist officer that had switched and joined the rebels. And so he was leading the Mexican insurgent against the new viceroy, Vincent R. Guido. And so on February 24th, 1821, they proposed a blueprint for independence called the Plan, Plan de Igua, Iguala. Excuse my pronunciation. The plan offered three guarantees for peace in Mexico. The preservation of the Catholic Church's status, the independence of Mexico as a constitutional republic, and the equality of, of all people, despite of where they were born or to whom they were born. And so, although there were some Spanish authorities that resisted to this, pretty much it was met with with some sort of general general approval by both civilian and military quarters on on royalist and republican sides. The Plan de Iguala was a precursor to the Treaty of Cordoba that would finally grant Mexico's independence from Spain. So the Treaty of Cordoba, in July of 1821, Spain sent some new leadership into Mexico to try to, to try to get things going again, and to, and to get rid of this Plan de Iguala, and to um, and to get New Mexico, New Spain under Spanish authority again. Well, what they found when they arrived was that the loyalists only controlled Mexico City and the city and the port city of Veracruz. This pretty much uh, meant that there was no way that they could get the momentum back from uh, the fight for Mexican independence. So they set up a meeting with the, this new, the new leadership in, in Mexico. And they said, hey, come to Cordoba and let's talk about this. So on August 24, 1821, they met in the town of Cordoba, which was between Mexico City and Veracruz, and they signed the Treaty of Cordoba, which pretty much said, Spain grants Mexico's independence. Mexico is now an independent nation after this. So in this, in this part of the lecture, we're going to see what the Mexican fight for independence meant for Texas. On this slide, I wanted to talk about the revolutions in Texas and just give you a, a little historiography uh, lesson. So when, when most people think about Texas Revolution, they think about the Texas Revolution of 1835-1836, which created the, the Republic of Texas. What, what they don't realize, there was actually two struggles for independence in Texas. The first struggle was, was to fight for independence from Spain, which created Mexico. The Tejanos, and the Tejanos is the name given by historians to the people living in Texas at this time. They they joined the, the, the rebels, called the Republicans, and they paid a heavy price for their loyalty to them. About 43% of the Tejano population, not just soldiers, but the total population, were killed during this time. The second fight for Texas independence is the one that we're uh, very familiar with. It was the Texas Revolution fight for independence from Mexico in 1835-1836. And later on, we'll, we'll study that the Texas fight for independence in 1835-1836 wasn't a standalone event. There was other Mexican states in revolt at the same time as Texas. It was just that Texas was the one that succeeded in, in gaining its independence and breaking away from Mexico. Dr. Andres Tiarina, he's a professor of history at Austin Community College, and he's also a guest, uh, a guest speaker at Texas State Historical Association. I included a five-minute clip uh, from his uh, conference that he's having in, in the Texas State Historical Association that I think you would find uh, knowledgeable about what I just talked about. So just real fast, I want to talk about the capital of Texas during um, all of this time. In, in the previous lecture, I said that San Antonio would serve as the capital of Texas, both officially and unofficially, because of its geographic location and the size of its settlement. Well, from 1772 until 1824, San Antonio did officially serve as the, the province of Texas capital. After the war, 
after the the war for Mexican independence was was uh, concluded in 1824, the capital was moved from San Antonio to to Saltillo, down uh, by Monterey, and then Texas became a part of uh, Coahuila, and it became Coahuila in Texas after 1824. When the Anglo colonization started after uh, 1822. Stephen F. Austin created a settlement called San Felipe de Austin near uh, south of Houston, present day Houston. And so it wasn't an attempt by the Anglos to, to gain independence from Mexico. What it was was uh, San, San Felipe de Austin became just a colony's capital. And it, the only purpose was, was so people had a, a place to go to so they could they could uh, lay claim to land, get get their get their grant. And then move on out there, and that's a really was the only purpose uh, for it. So, so San Antonio was the capital until 1824. And afterwards, it moved to Saltillo, and San Felipe de Austin was the capital for Austin's colony uh, during the Anglo colonization. During Mexico's fight for independence in, in Texas, there was two major events that were noteworthy. One was the Casa Revolt. So after Father Hidalgo had declared his Grito de Dolores, he sent agents out to the different parts of New Spain to try to garner support for his rebellion. One of those places was Texas. Well, the Texas governor at the time, uh, Manuel de Sacedo, tried to stop these agents from succeeding in spreading rebellion to Texas. Well, he was, his efforts were, were, were ineffective, basically. On January 21st, 1811, a retired military officer, he, he was more of a retired militia officer. His name was Juan Batista de las Casas. And he staged a coup and captured Governor Salcedo. And the first thing he did was he went and arrested all the Europeans, the, the Peninsulares and the loyal Carrillos, and took all their possessions and handed them out to the different parts of the people, uh, the, the loyal Republicans in the rebellion. He next sent a delegation to Nacogdoches to try to establish his authority in the northeastern part of the state where there was a large uh, large part of the population located up there. Well, as you can imagine, not everyone in San Antonio was on board with the Mexican revolt. In February 1811, the, the royalists to, to Spain, Count uh, we'll call them counter-revolutionaries. They held a secret meeting uh, to plan how they're going to take back San Antonio. In March 2nd, 1811, they acted this plan and took control of the army barracks and other important buildings in San Antonio. Then they went to where Casas was living and they apprehended him. After they did this, they released all the Europeans that were in jail and returned all their confiscated property. Casas was taken down to Mexico City and he was found guilty of high treason on January, July 29th, 1811. On August 3rd, about four days later, he, he was executed. Just like Father Hidalgo, his corpse was decapitated and his head sent to, back to San Antonio to be placed on the pike in the main plaza center. The second significant event that happened in Texas during Mexico's fight for independence was the Battle of Medina which is, is considered by historians to be the largest and bloodiest battle ever fought on Texas soil. In February 1811, Royalist General Joaquin de Arredano had successfully moved across the Rio Grande into Texas. He immediately starts to seek, seek out revolutionaries uh, to punish them for the rebellion, which in, in this slide, revolutionaries are also called Republicans. A Republican army rode out to meet the Royalist threat. It was made up mainly of Tejanos, but also some local Indians and Anglos from the Catetus McGee expedition, which we'll talk about later on in this lecture. On August 18, 1830, Royalist scouts lured the Republican army out into an ambush. The Republican army under General Jose Alvarez leaves San Antonio and heads south uh, towards the Medina River. The Royalist army of about 1,830 men we're waiting for them in an ambush. What's interesting about this is there was a young 
lieutenant named Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana that would learn from Maradano how to deal with those in rebellion against uh, authority. And it would be a lesson that he would remember and put into practice 15 years later. Or, excuse me, 13 years later. So, anyways, Royalist scouts get the Republican Army to come into the in, around the Medina River. That was where the Royalist forces sprang their, their trap on the helpless Republican Army. And so it was basically about a four or five hour running battle over uh, a couple of miles. And at the end of it, almost all of the uh, Republican Army was slaughtered, except for about 100 of them, where they fled up back to San Antonio. What was surprising was to the Republicans 1300 uh, man loss, the Royalists only lost 55 men in the total in all the battles. The Royalists buried their dead uh, on the way back to San Antonio. The 1300 bodies of the fallen Republicans were left to were left to lie where they fell, unburied for nine total years. Later on, when when the when Mexico got their independence and and Texas became a state with Coila, the, the Mexican governor ordered a detachment of soldiers to go and gather the, the bones of the Republican army and to give them some sort of proper burial. So what was interesting about this from another historical view, no one knows exactly the location of the Battle of Medina. You'll If you go south of San Antonio around Petite, you'll see some, some markers up they, they believe that there's they that they have a general area of where the Battle of Medina was, but no one knows the exact parameters of the battlefield. Not like we do with Gettysburg and Vicksburg and places like that. So this is something that historians are, are still working on, and hopefully some more um, some more information may come out about the Battle of Medina. Real fast, I want to talk about filibusters. The a filibuster is known as a military venture, and what they do is is they try to go in and to a rebellious nation, and they try to join um, the rebelling side into uh, fighting for independence. Usually, they hope to uh, that if the rebellion is successful, they hope to find some office to hold or maybe uh, be rewarded with some land. A military venture, uh, a filibuster isn't a mercenary per se, because mercenary fights for. Uh, whoever pays in the highest. A filibuster usually has is idealistic and wants to join the, the side of the, of the rebellion. In Texas, there was four filibusters uh, that went on during the uh, fight for Mexican independence. They were the Nolan Expedition, the Gutierrez McGee Expedition, the Mina Expedition, and then the Long Expedition. Expedition. Some of the expeditions they they wanted to help Mexico. Uh, gain their independence. Some wanted Texas to become uh, independent from Spain and become a, a, a nation of, on its own. All pretty much all the uh, expeditions were were unsuccessful in gaining independence uh, for Texas, but they were successful in that they brought a lot of attention to Texas uh, from the public in the United States, especially through the newspapers. The newspapers were keeping up with what the expedition was doing. They were also keeping up with what was going on with the uh, Mexican rebellion against Spain. And so what all this would do would bring Texas to the forefront, to to the public's uh, mind. And so when, when Mexico got its independence from Spain and they, they started doing the impresario system, a lot of the American public was was interested in getting this uh, land in Texas, which we'll see later on when we study the impresario system. So the first expedition I want to talk about is the Nolan expedition, and it started by a guy named Philip Nolan. And Nolan wasn't really he wasn't a filibuster in the truest sense. He was a, a horse wrangler, and what he did was he would go into Texas, capture wild wild horses, and then sell them in New Orleans, and so. He had a and he had an agreement with the governor, French governor of Louisiana, and the Spanish governor of Texas to be doing this. Well, what Nolan didn't know was, uh, before his next venture into Texas, the Spanish governor he had an agreement with was replaced by another governor who didn't share the agreement uh, with Nolan. Another thing, 
that Nolan didn't know about was the, the new Spanish governor knew about a meeting that Nolan had with uh, General uh, Wilkerson, who was stationed in the newly acquired uh, uh, Louisiana Purchase of 1803 about ma possibly making Texas an independent nation that might later on join the United States. Uh, whether or not Nolan agreed to this is not known, but he did have the talk with Wilkerson, and the Spanish governor knew about this. So when he, so the Spanish governor sent out an order to the troops in Texas that when they saw Nolan, they were to arrest him. And so a few days later, the Spanish cavalry, a Spanish cavalry unit, caught up with Nolan, camping out on the Brazos River. During that during that fight, uh, Nolan was killed. And his second in command, a guy named Peter Ellis Bean, took over. He put up a good fight, but they were eventually outnumbered, and they all and they ran out. And Nolan's expedition ran out of ammunition, so Bean was forced to surrender. It was there that that the expedition was was forced to march into Mexico. Uh, the Spanish allowed the the slaves to go free, and they and the the slaves asked permission to bury uh, Nolan's body which the Spanish allowed, but only after they, they cut off uh, Nolan's ears uh, so that they could be sent to the governor as, as a trophy. The King of Spain decreed that every fifth prisoner from this expedition was to be hanged um, as a pirate, and the rest was, was to be sentenced to 10 years of hard labor. Well, during this time, while they were waiting for the judgment to be passed, nine of the filibusters had died in prison. And so um, the authorities in Mexico kind of had some um, some sympathy to them and so what they did was they they blindfolded them and had them dice and the unlucky person that uh, that lost at this would would be the only one that would be hanged and that honor fell upon Ephraim Blackburn who threw the lowest number and was duly hanged eventually the, the rest that didn't die in prison uh, served their time and were released what was interesting about Peter Ellis Bean was he volunteered to stay in Mexico and he served as a colonel in the Mexican army. He married a rich widow and he died at an old age down in Mexico. The second expedition is one that we've already discussed earlier. Now it's the Gatetis McGee expedition. As I said earlier, Father Hidalgo sent out a bunch of supporters uh, to the different parts of New Spain to try to get support for his rebellion. He also sent some supporters to the United States in, in hopes of trying to gain some money, supplies, and recruits to help out. One of the, one of his supporters that went to New Orleans was Bernardo Gutierrez de Lada. And so he, he went there to try to help out any way that the people there could, could help out. Um, while he was there, he met a disgruntled U.S. Army lieutenant named Augustus McGee. And it's not known whether or not McGee uh, deserted from the Army or he was discharged from the Army. But he he, he soon agrees to, to uh, join up with the Guterres um, in the neutral zone. And then they, they they get a force, they get supplies, and they get money, and they head into, uh, into Texas. And so what in 1812, when they... The, one of the first things they did when they got into Texas was they captured uh, Nacogdoches. And with an army that was made up of, of Tejanos, Native Americans, and Anglo Americans, uh, once they captured Nacogdoches, they then head south and they take control of La Bahia. The, the reason why they were so uh, they were able to so easily capture Nacogdoches and La Bahia was there wasn't a lot of troops stationed there. So they had a large force, a couple hundred uh, guys that were e able to easily capture Nacogdoches and La Bahia. While the Gutierrez McGee ex expedition was at La Bahia, they issued a declaration for the independence of Texas, not just Mexico, but of Texas. Well, the Royalist force, forces got wind of this, and the Texas governor of Salcedo, uh, the Texas governor uh, Salcedo, organized uh, the Royalist forces, went to La Bahia, and surrounded it. While this fight was going on, uh, Lieutenant McGee is killed, and Samuel Kemper takes over for uh, McGee. The Republican forces that are uh, located in La Bahia, the, the expedition members, break out from La Bahia, and they head to San Antonio, where they, where they take over the city because the Royalist forces from there are with Sacedo out uh, in the coastal area, 
try to put down the rebellion. While the, while they're there in San Antonio, Gutierrez and Kemper quarrel over how to run Texas and and how to govern it, basically. Where Kemper wants everybody to be elected, just like they do in the United States. Gutierrez wants uh, everybody to be appointed, like they do in Mexico and Spain. Anyways, in August 1813, they get their they get word that the Royalist Army is south of San Antonio. They sent out scouts uh, to try to find them. And so uh, the, the Royalist scouts managed to lure them into a trap. So the, the Republican forces, which the Gatetas McGee expedition are part of, are lured out of San Antonio. And then what, what happens next is the Battle of Medina, which we covered earlier. And as we know from the previous slide, pretty much uh, 13... 1,300 of the 1,400 troops of the Re Republican Army are slaughtered. Interesting enough, Gatetis, uh survives, and he makes it back to the U.S., where he tries to, to get support again for the uh, Mexican Rebellion for Independence. The third expedition I want to talk about is the Mina Expedition of 1817. Former General Francisco Xavier Mina went to New Orleans to uh, build up a force uh, for a filibustering expedition into Mexico. On April 7, 1817, he sailed out of New Orleans uh, for Galveston, where he hoped to gather more men and supplies for an ex expedition in, into Mexico. He's, he's able to, while at Galveston, he's able to gather up eight ships and 235 men to go with him. On April, four days later, on April 11th, 1817, he arrives at, at the Santana River, which is just north of Brownsville. He moves on down south, and minus forces are able to capture so Soto La Marina, which is halfway between this, the current city of Brownsville and Topeka, Mexico. That was his probably his, his most major victory. He has some other minor victories around the area, but... A few months later, in October 20, 27th, Royalist forces are able to defeat the Mina expedition. Mina himself was taken to Mexico City and was executed along with 25 others of his expedition at Fort San Gregorio on November 11th. Mina was only 28 years old at the time of his death. The fourth expedition I want to talk about is a long expedition that started in 1819. In June of 1819, Dr. James Long, a citizen of Natchez, Mississippi, organized an expedition to invade Texas and establish a republic. He had gained a reputation in the area for fighting at New Orleans with, alongside uh, Andrew Jackson. What was interesting was with, with Long, he decided to take his wife Jane and, and their infant child along on the expedition. So, when Long decided to, to cross into Texas, he had eight, only 80 men with him along with his family. But by the time he crossed the Sabine River and was heading towards Nacogdoches, his forces had grown to 300, to again include uh, Tejanos, Indians, and Anglos. What was interesting, too, uh, Gutierrez from the Gutierrez McGee expedition would join him on this expedition as well. So, again... Nacogdoches is, is barely defended and is easily uh, captured by the Long Expedition. It was there that Long decided to declare Texas a free and independent republic, and Long made himself the president. He then began selling, became uh, a uh, de facto impresario by selling land to uh, settlers on generous terms. He also established uh, outposts on the Trinity and Brazos River to help uh, fight off any royalty, uh, royalist uh, forces. Once he, once he kind of established a foothold in Texas, he went to Galveston, where he wanted to meet with the pirate Jean Lafitte, who had kind of control, who had control of the uh, Galveston Island. Lafitte was courteous to, to Long and, and displayed uh, wishes for his success in the expedition, but Lafitte did not want to join the filibuster expedition into uh, Mexico, um, and to establish Texas in, as an independent nation. 
On his return to Nacogdoches, Long found that the settlement was nearly deserted. And what happened was a royalist force had arrived while Long was in Galveston, and they killed uh, part of his expedition to include his brother. The other uh, followers there uh, were captured. And so Long, with his wife and child, fled back to Louisiana. But despite this defeat, Long was discouraged, and he went to New Orleans and was able to quickly uh, build up another expedition. This time, uh, Long set out for Texas, but in boats. And they didn't go uh, to Nacogdoches. They set up a point at Point Bolivar, uh, which is north of Galveston. And in 1821, they arrived there, and they built the fort, the fort Las Casas. It was there that he was able to build a base of support for him and his, and his expedition. After they did that, they left Point Bolivar, and they went down to uh, to La Bahia, where again, the Fort uh, La Bahia was, was lightly defended and was easily taken. But Royalist forces in Texas soon got word of what Long was doing, and they rode it to La Bahia and was able to surround and capture the group. In May of 1822, Long was, was taken down to Mexico City for trial. While he was in prison, a guard there shot him uh, during an alleged escape attempt by Long. And that pretty much ended the Long expedition of 1822. As we mentioned before, James Long brought his family along with him on his expedition adventures into Texas uh, twice. And the second time in 1821, he left his family at Point Bolivar at Fort Las Casas while he went to take uh, La Bahia. It was Jane Long, a surviving daughter. Uh, I say surviving daughter because they, uh, she had two children and one died when they were at Nacogdoches. And it was a, a young slave girl named Kean who was left at Fort Las Casas when James Long went down to take La Bahia. There was other family members and support members there as well. But after the expedition left to go to take La Bahia, they, the others started to slowly leave to, to return back home to the United States. Soon, it was uh, Jane Long, her daughter, and Kean were the only ones left at the fort. And, and that winter, the winter of 1821, was very brutal. Uh, they did manage to hunt game, to fish, gather oysters, uh, while they were also trying to fight off illness, starvation, and hostile Indians. It was very brutal, but they managed to do it. Uh, it was December of 1821. Uh, in an ice-covered tent, Jane gave birth uh, to her uh, third child with Kean helping to deliver the baby. R real fast, I want to talk about Jane Long and the nickname given to her as Mother of Texas. She kind of gave this nickname to herself because she earnestly thought that she was the first Anglo woman to give birth to an Anglo baby in Texas. After historians studied uh, other census records from uh, before the Longs arrived in Texas, they found that other Anglo babies had been born before Jane Long's baby had been born. So even though it was wrong to call her the mother of Texas, uh, the moniker kind of stayed with her throughout Texas history. So she is unofficially given the name mother of Texas. Anyways, going back to, to their survival at Fort Las Casas, they were near starvation, and luckily for them, in the summer of 1822, new settlers started to arrive. These new settlers were part of, of Cienva Voss's impresario contract that were first arriving to uh, lay claim to their land grants. It was there in the summer of 1822 that Jane Long learned that, uh, of James Long's death in Mexico City. She was, she was widowed at the age of 24. Unfortunately for her, two years later, the baby that she gave birth to in December of 1821 would die. She, after this, she returned back to the United States. But when Stephen Van Boston was given more uh, impresario contracts, she returned in 1824 and was able to get some land in, in what is now Fort Bend in Waller County. In the year 1832 and later in 1837, she would open up a boarding house in Brazoria, which is a port city uh, at the mouth of the Brazos River, and then later on in, in a place called Richmond, Texas, 
which is south of Houston. Jane and Ken both ran the, the uh, Richmond boarding house. It was there that she she said that um, she met uh, some of the early Texas revolutionary heroes, such as Ben Milam, Sam Houston, and Mary B. B. Lamar. Uh, they had, did stay at her boarding house, and she said that they tried to court her and get her to marry them, but that is unproven. But it's a part of, part of folklore, so it's told anyways. While while Jane was at Richmond and was receiving success from her two boarding houses, she managed to buy land and get some uh, plantation going where she raised cattle and, and was able to raise cotton with the help of, of 19 slaves. After the Civil War, the slaves were freed and the land was worked by tenant farmers. Kean stayed next to Jane's side uh, pretty much uh, her whole life. Kean, uh, when she was in Richmond, she married herself and had four children. And she remained in Richmond to, to help Jane run the boarding house there. In December of 1880, Jane Long died at the age of 82. It should be noted that she never married, um, she never married anyone else besides Jane Long. On this slide, I went into give an honorable mention to Jean Lafitte in Galveston, probably the only pirate known to uh, establish a base here in Texas. Jean Lafitte was a privateer and smuggler, pretty much a pirate, who interrupted his adventures to fight for the United States uh, in the War of 1812 in the defense of the New Orleans, back when uh, Andrew Jackson was defeating the British there. After the war, he went back to his uh, privateering and smuggling ways. And in 1817, with about a thousand followers, he managed to organize a settlement, uh, essentially a base of operations, at a place called Campeche on the uh, Galveston Island uh, near the future site of the city of Galveston. And it's not known whether or not when he did this, whether if he, he had the permission from the French governor in Louisiana or the Spanish governor of Texas to do this. He did it anyways. And he was kind of considered the, the governor of Galveston Island. From there, he continued his, uh, his privateering ways against the Spanish, especially when during Mexico's fight for independence. It, it's said that his, uh, his fight against the Spanish shipping may have helped uh, Mexico gain its independence. This glory, though, was short-lived as some of his subordinates started to attack U.S. ships in 1820. What this did was it brought unwanted attention from the United States, which had a, a, a stronger navy than the Spanish did in the Gulf of, of Mexico against Lafitte's operations there. Finally, the pressure was too great. In the following year, Lafitte unexpectedly picked a man, uh, picked a, a picked men to man his favorite vessel called the pride he burnt the town down and he left galveston to go take up operations somewhere else he would continue his operations uh harassing spanish shipping until until the colonies got uh got their independence and after that it's not known what happens to him This concludes the lecture on Mexican independence and its significance to, to the state of Texas.